became a very um, wonderful trial attorney in Pennsylvania and a wonderful father and a wonderful husband and um, has been a tremendous teacher and mentor to me and he continues to be a teacher and mentor to me and I can't say enough about him and how much I feel for him and the, the guidance he's given me in um, the courtroom and in life, in the law, as a daughter. I could just go on and on. Marshal Judge Peck, you're here us. Thank you. I would also say Justice Scalia, but not for the reason that probably everybody here is sitting here thinking. It is because I love that he reached across and was really good friends with Justice Stanley Ginsburg. I like the idea that intellectually you can have completely different intellectual thoughts, but you can have a discourse about it and you can be friends. And that's what I'm interested in in society, quite frankly, balance. Quite frankly, and with all due respect, I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat, um, whatever your leanings are, what we I'd like to do is have us all have a more friendlier discourse about everything that's happening and to have a more unified society so that we can come together. On a personal note, I will tell you several of the judges that I now serve with um, in Dauphin County. About her. I remember I was a young DA, got in front of Judge Lazarus on the bench and um, watched her you know, become one of the best trial judges in the city of Philadelphia, and, uh, become one of the best appellate court judges. But uh, you know, there's so many great judges I can kind of pick from, including my brother. But if I have to name one person, it's probably somebody that many people in this room don't even know about. It's a federal judge by the name of Ed Becker. Mm -hmm. uh, I tried cases in front of him when I first left the DA's office. My personal hero, obviously, is my mom and dad. Um, for those of you who don't know anything about our family's backgrounds, my mother and father were from Belfast, Northern Ireland. My father went to the uh, fourth grade and my mother went to the second grade. And uh, they emigrated to this country after my father was beaten into a coma in sectarian violence. My dad got on a boat, came to this country with $56 in his pocket, and brought his family over, his three children, raised seven children, every one of them has a college degree. One of them ascended to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. and. Uh, my mother and father lived the American dream, and I wouldn't be where I am right now without my mom and dad. And Miss King, your hero. I think my hero is my mentor, uh, Justice Thomas Saylor of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Uh, I did not go straight from law school and then clerk. I actually worked in the district attorney's office in Lancaster County, and I had become the head of the child abuse unit at a young age in Lancaster. And then I had the opportunity to clerk for Justice Saylor. And what he taught me was how to critically think and write effectively. And I remember getting multiple uh, uh, papers back uh, covered in red pen, and uh, I learned from it. And it was about making sure that you critically think about what you want to say, and making sure that you're following the law as it is written, and actually having the law guide you to your decision, rather than having something in your mind and coming and making the laws work to what it is you want the outcome to be. So I think Justice Saylor would be my mentor. On a personal note, I would also say, as everyone else has, um, my parents. And my father is what I would also describe as living the American dream. Um, he was a mailman from Saraville, New Jersey, and put himself through law school at night. And uh, he worked incredibly hard. He also believed in public service. He entered into the Peace Corps when his eyesight disqualified him from serving our country. And so then he was also able to put all of us, all three of us, uh, through uh, college. And uh, I'm so grateful. And I also have to give a shout out to my mother as well because every day she comes to my home from three to six to make sure that my children are safe. And I am so grateful. Terrific. Um, so uh, the next question I want to ask is I want I want an example of a situation where you had a particularly difficult case or an ethical dilemma or something that was very difficult for you to resolve, an issue that's very difficult for you to resolve. Tell us about it and how you resolved it. I mean, ethical scenario, it could be a particularly hard or emotionally trying case. Pick an example, tell us about it and how you resolved it. We'll start with Ms. Teresa for this one. Well, working with my father, I've had a lot of those. 
Um, I, I, can, I can think of one where um, we were going, um, filing an appeal to the Supreme Court of Ohio on a, a, um, a, a product case. It was a football helmet case where the boy broke his neck and there was, because there was no air in the helmet. And um, we, we, I wanted to make three arguments and he wanted to make five. And, <laughs> and I didn't want to disappoint him. And, um, and I had to fit them all into you know, to the 10 pages. And, and so we, we, we argued and we fought and um, uh, eventually um, we came to a compromise and um, he, 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 um, my, my two first arguments that I wanted and then, I, and then he had the third argument. We ended up running so late that we um, had to fax it the court and um, we um, reversed the lower court and it's now a precedential decision in the Supreme Court of Ohio um, concerning the um, they they call the federal rules of evidence an expert testimony um, and um, I, I was just I, I couldn't believe that we were able to make it through that and um, eventually come out on top I never thought that that case would be uh, reversed and we would have a precedential decision. Uh, and I, I just have to interject because I want to tell you, you were right. Because if you have a choice between arguing three issues and five, every appellate judge will tell you, and I'm sure everyone in this room will tell you, argue three, not five. So history will judge that you were correct in your position. I, I, I had read books and I had studied it and I kept telling you, <laughs> this is the way to do it, Dad. So, uh, our Judge Peck, tell us about uh, a hard case, an emotionally trying case, or an ethical dilemma you faced and how you resolved it. I'm not sure it's ethical, but I've had several civil cases that involve statutory construction, for example, of zoning ordinances, things of that sort, that have been difficult because really you could read the statute two different ways, but obviously that's what we're to be doing, and you come down on the side that you believe to be correct, but can't wait for the Superior Court to make a decision about exactly whether I interpreted that correctly or not. But those those are difficult intellectually to try to make sure you're you're reading it exactly the way that it was in it was written. But on a different note, I will say that every single time that I am in court on a termination of parental rights hearing, I've told all of you that my heart is kind of in children and youth proceedings, as it is in all um, areas of law that come to me, but children and youth proceedings are particularly of interest to me involving children. And every single time I have one of those in court, it's difficult because you want the situation to be different. You want um, the parents to have been doing uh, what is required or overcoming addictions to get to where they need to be. So I want the situation to be difficult, or excuse me, to be better than what it is. But that being said, there's also times where it's a beautiful thing because everybody comes together, they see that there's more resources, and then there ends up being more resources for the child than just if the child had only had the parents. They end up finding other family members that come forward. So while it's very difficult to handle those types of cases, it's also sometimes a beautiful thing because the child is happy, hopefully, in the end. Judge McCaffrey. Honestly, I'm sitting here listening to the answers and I'm trying to think of that little dilemma I've had, but to be honest with you, I really can't think of anything. I, I, um, I come from a, a, a background where my mother and father kind of instill certain solid values into our family. Um, if something's wrong, and I have a clearly defined belief that it's wrong, I just don't do it. Um, so from an ethical dilemma, I don't want to sound pious or sound holier than now, but um, ethical dilemmas are usually brought about by you know, challenges in individual ethics and from my perspective. I've never really come across a situation where I call something's wrong, but I should do it. It's wrong, I don't do it, and if it hurts me, it hurts me. If it helps me, I don't do it anyway. So from an ethical dilemma, I haven't really had one. Um, uh, as far as tough cases are concerned, I mean, I, I think Judge Peck will kind of agree with this. Every case you deal with on an individual basis is a very, very difficult case. Um, in 28 years, I can tell you right now, the most difficult case I've ever handled was, was about two weeks ago. Um, when you hear cases, you, you know, you're taught to kind of keep an open mind um, and you know, told me all the evidence is in and the case is over, but I handled a case about two weeks ago and it was a sex assault. Um, a young lady and her former boyfriend, and when she had finished her testimony, I was 100% convinced that uh, what happened to her was she firmly believed that she was raped. Um, after listening to her and her father, and then I heard the defense, and I firmly believed that they believed it was consensual sex, and um, it was the most uh, heart-wrenching, 
decision I've ever had to make in 28 years uh, as a judge. That's probably the thing that come, comes to mind, closest to comes to mind. Thank you. Uh, Ms. King, tough say, cases or ethical dilemmas? Um, I would say both, all in one case. I, and actually, doing the child abuse cases, I handled the homicides, the sexual and physical abuse of, of children, and um, also I did the elderly cases as well as care dependent adults. And, and those are very difficult on a daily basis. I, uh, I had one case, though, recently that stands out and it involved a child who was part of the deaf community who was sexually assaulted horrifically uh, since she was seven years old up until the time she was 14 years old. And there, there there's uh, the mechanisms of the courtroom, you need multiple interpreters, and it, it's just, it makes it kind of difficult uh, on that one regard. And, and um, she really struggled in having to testify about what happened. And uh, I, I've done this for so many years, but I can tell you some of them really hit you hard. And I knew if I put her on that stand that it would cause further harm. So even though I, I knew if I had taken that case to trial, I probably would have gotten a bigger sentence, but it would have come at a cost. And so I, I chose to, to enter the plea agreement to save her from having to justify. And that was a really hard choice for me because I knew what a horrible person he was and I wanted him to spend a longer time in prison. But sometimes you have to, to look at doing the right thing. And for me on that day, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't put that girl up on the stand. And Ms. Warren. When I was the district attorney, I have two cases that immediately come to mind. Um, the first was a judge's daughter who had engaged in criminal activity and she was charged by the state police. And I received a lot of calls telling me that I should not be prosecuting her. Uh, I prosecuted her anyway because she's to be treated just as everybody else in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is to be treated. And I received a conviction. When I was the district attorney, I also had a situation um, where one of our local chiefs of police with whom I was very close because I worked closely with law enforcement, uh, was unfortunately using illegal substances and he was charged with the crime as well. I turned that over to the Attorney General's office because I did not want there to be any appearance of impropriety or favoritism and he also was convicted. Um, but before the charges were filed, I received a lot of contacts from individual individuals asking me not to prosecute him. But at the end of the day, you need to know that you're doing the right thing and that you have integrity and that you are being true to the principles of law and the justice system. Because if we can't count on the people in the justice system to do the right thing, then who can we count on? All right, so now let's talk money. Uh, this wouldn't be a Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts event and I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask about elections of judges and campaign contributions. So, Judge Peck, we'll start with you. Uh, elections and campaign contributions, there are facts of life in Pennsylvania. You need campaign you need campaign contributions to run a campaign in order to run for office statewide. And we have canons of judicial ethics that require recusal for certain kinds of contributions. But my question is, is there anything special or different that you would do personally elected as a Superior Court judge to avoid any appearance of impropriety uh, with respect to any campaign contributions you may receive during this campaign? Of course, I would follow the judicial canons. Um, we start uh, at starting place. In fact, they changed in 2014, and fortunately at our State Trial Judges Association, we got good training on exactly what all of those changes in the judicial canons meant in terms of political contributions. As I said, I'm interested in taking politics out of the courts um, so it is frustrating as a candidate, and it's apropos, of course, that you're asking it now because we're all going through it right now, uh, but it's frustrating as a candidate for that to come into play because certain people try to push you into certain directions, um, and, and that's a frustrating thing because as, as a sitting judge right now, I'm not used to that, um, and, and it doesn't, it feels uncomfortable to me. But the first rule of thumb is, is disclosure.
different, different issues, issues and concerns. And concerns. I'm finding, I'm so, finding many, so many different mentalities that it, 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 it seems hard. It seems challenging. challenging. I don't say hard because the only thing hard, hard is the concrete that we walk on. Everything else is a challenge. So, so, I'm ready to.